yourself a little um, name sign like this. If you could just fill out your name sign, oh, absolutely. that would be great. I actually just went out, I was attending a seminar about an hour ago, so if you don't mind, I'm, like, I'm signing the test. He right. explained to me. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm no sorry. worries.
to sign sheets? Are you signing your Except way forgot to move the cap away, so there's still you can you can pick that for oh, yeah. 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 I know, right? Yeah. 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 Just add a left leg. Jason Bias. I am a very, very recent graduate from the University of Oklahoma. I studied philosophy and sociology. I'm here with the all the OU groups, which is the objectivism group, the Students for a Stateless Society, and Young Americans for Liberty. 
My name is Wade Craig. I'm an economics junior at OU with Jason. I run our chapter of Americans for Liberty. I'm Eric Olson. Uh, I'm from UG Arlington, freshman in studies and management. Uh, although, hopefully, I get into practice next year so I can get out of trouble in school. <laughs> Um, I'm Mackenzie. I am a freshman journalism poli sci major at TCU and I'm the vice president of the SFL chapter. I'm Matt. I'm a junior political science and sociology double major going to Texas A&M and I work for SFL as a campus coordinator. I'm uh, Paul. I'm a sophomore at A&M studying computer engineering. I'm a vice president of our Yale chapter and I also involved in our MVP community. Uh, I'm Lucas Ostowski. I'm a junior uh, journalism major and government monitor at the University of Texas at Austin. And I work with uh, the VP for, uh, for Young Americans for Liberty and I'm an SFL coordinator. Uh, my name is Dan, I'm an English major at UT. Uh, <laughs> and I run the uh, student study chapter as an advisor. I'm Taylor and I'm an international studies major at Texas State University. Do you need something to say? No, 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 I'm just observing. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm Clayton Cummings. I am a history major and a Spanish minor here at UNT. And uh, I have started coming to a couple of Young Americans for Liberty discussions. And I kind of came here last minute. <laughs> but uh, I've really. I'm Tamina. I'm from Holland College. I'm the president of our Yale chapter. And I'm majoring in finance. Uh, my name is Nicholas Evans. I am getting a major in computer science at Collin College. I'm not sure where I'm going to transfer yet. Uh, maybe here at U.S. Computer Institute. Um, but yeah, I'm the vice president and uh, hopeful for TCU. Um, my name is Caitlin Fife. Um, I'm a psychology major at Texas State. Um, I am the president of our y'all chapter there. And I'm <laughs> I'm Eric Corey, I'm studying philosophy at Central State College, and I'm a campus coordinator in South and I'm going to be reading. But you know what, I think this could be some good reading for me. Yeah, that's probably good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Justin. I'm going to just introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Jeff Nora. This chapter of Democracy in America, and I hope everybody, did everybody read the background chapter also? Because I'd like to be able to refer to it. In this kind of discussion, we don't uh, refer to outside material except in the most general way. And um, whatever questions you have or reasons that you have for what you say you want to see, we'll kind of talk to you. So I was wondering, does anybody have a question they have about the text that they'd like to bring up? Something they didn't understand or they want to talk about? Um, I was just interested in knowing, um, this is Tocqueville's sort of like a snapshot. He went, came to the U.S. to study their, our prison systems, and this was his opinion of what he saw and what he felt as he was traveling and doing what he was assigned to do by the French government. So I look at this, because to me, you know, this is just a snapshot of his opinion at this point in time. So why look at just this and not his later works where his opinions had changed. I, I don't know what his opinions are. This is the only work I've actually read to fully so that I have to work with. Well, I, I'm sorry, but I think that kind of question needs to be left for maybe the end of the chapter. Because what we want to do first is make sure that we have questions about what the text actually said and see if we understand it. Okay? Um, I was kind of confused overall, like, where he actually said it felt like he was talking in circles. And I was just trying to grasp what his definition of equality versus freedom necessarily would be. 
what uh, the very particular part of the text that he uses. I have, I have the paragraph number for this if you try to refer to them. So I'm looking at paragraph three, the very last sentence. Mm -hmm. I am the case which men have for liberty and that which they feel for equality are in fact two different things. And I'm not afraid to add that unless the democratic nations they are two different people things. Where is this definition of equality and freedom? I just didn't seem to find it at all. Does anybody else have anywhere in the text where they think it might give us a clue as to what he means by equality? Um, well, I think he's more referring to some later things of it. He's referring to like the French idea of equality. And on um, paragraph, six, six, yeah. paragraph six somewhere, uh, he says that. Can you point to the part in paragraph six? Which one? It's better for us to go slower and be more accurate about what we're actually referring to than to worry about do we have to get to it. Um, it says, uh, but the pleasures of equality are self Where is it in the very last sentence? Okay. Yeah. But the last one sentence is Right. Mm -hmm. It says, uh, but the uh, pleasures of equality are self proffered Each of the petty instances of life seems to occasion them, and in order to taste them, nothing is required but liberty. But it, um, the sentence before that, too. He says, the passion which equality engenders must therefore be at once strong and general. Men cannot enjoy political liberty unpurchased by sac some sacrifices. They never obtain it without their assertions. So, um... How is that a different thing? I can't really speak into the question. Well, um, I think what he's, uh, referring to there is, I guess, is more like the French, um, idea of equality in the, from the French Revolution, the whole liberté, égalité, you know, fraternity, those things. And what he's saying somewhere in here was the fact that the French will, you know, sacrifice freedom, disregard it for, um, for, you know, for equality. And he's saying that freedom is better. Um, and maybe can we find some place in the text where he's actually giving a quasi definition of what he means? See if I can answer some of these questions. I, I understand that he's saying that freedom is better. Mm -hmm. I just don't know what he means by equality. Because that's important that some people can associate uh, equality as uh, equality of outcome or equality of opportunity. Uh, those are two completely opposite things. So. Yeah. Uh, kind of just a yes. description of uh, <coughs> freedom or equality. Uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to get to what he means by the word equality. And he says equality is the distinguish. This is an, I'm sorry, last sentence of paragraph four. Um, he says equality is the distinguishing characteristic of the age they live in. Oh, actually, I should read it over again. I don't know if this answers it or not. But it says, ask not what singular charm the men of democratic ages find in being equal, or what special reasons they may have to cling so tenaciously to equality relative to the other advantages which society holds out to them. Equality is the distinguishing characteristic of the age they live in. That of itself is enough to explain. It. That they refer to all the rest. So I'm not sure if that gives us the actual definition, but it kind of is explaining throughout this whole paragraph, like why equality and freedom are kind of at odds with one another, but also necessary. Uh, both are necessary in a democratic society. So I don't know if that was actually really helpful in answering your question. There's sort of a more straightforward definition. Mm -hmm. I think this is as close as we can get. It's the second sentence of paragraph three. It says, Equal rights may exist if indulging in the same pleasures, of entering the same professions, of frequenting the same places, in a word of living in the same manner and seeking wealth by the same means, although all men do not take an equal share in it. So what do you think about this? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, that's so how would we then <coughs> translate that if we made it into a definition? How would we turn it into a definition? Um, I think that is specifically talking about equality of opportunity, how it says, like, uh, indulging in the same pleasures and entering the same professions, like, that's sort of the opportunities that you would have as an individual, and if everyone has the ability to enter in the same professions or to pursue the same thing, then that is equality in his point of view. So, you're kind of saying, like, being more, uh, being more equal but dying. Um, I don't at all think that's what he's saying. He says, indulging the same pleasure, that's like people like, so 
and two people both have enough money to go to Six Flags or to sit there. I think he's making a distinction between opportunity and outcome. Just kind of a little bit later than a couple of hours. I actually thought in that sense he was kind of expanding upon a, a thought that he had in paragraph two, where he says, um, he says, as none is different, it's in the middle, he says, as none is different from his fellows, so none can exercise a tyrannical power. Men will be perfectly free because they will be entirely equal. And they will be perfectly equal because they will be entirely free. So it's kind of introducing this idea of, of like equality and, um, and uh, freedom, like mixing together in a sense that there's an equilibrium where, where one will be equal. Where there's a certain point where we can be perfectly equal and perfectly free. Uh, and then in that sentence where he says equality may be established in civil society without forbidding. Equal rights may exist in indulging the same pleasures, living the same pleasures, and living in the same places in the world, and living in the same manner, and seeking off for the same means, although all men do not take an equal share of the government. I think what he's really saying is that he's asserting that social equality can exist without direct political and democratic equality. That kind of does sound like equality of opportunity, not outcome. Because ultimately, he's saying in a free society, you will have the chance at equality of opportunity without the necessity of I'm trying to understand what, uh, can you think of a, I've been trying to come up with a specific example of a society which fits what he's describing here in paragraph two. Equal rights may exist in indulging the same pleasures, blah, 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 blah. Although all men do not take an equal share in the government.
She flies their airplanes, charters, and the, um, the citizens of Germany um, are generally there's no real world of class of Germany. It's very minimal. So could this like only exist like in socialist states? I believe so. So what what does same pleasure mean, right? Yeah. What is yeah, that? that yeah. So I mean, obviously, you're like, would you like apples for like? Or does that mean like? I mean, we would have to define it, discuss it. No, no, it's French. I think um, the French aristocracy had access to like, certain things, even though anybody else could get it. It was against the law for them to like wear a certain color or have to eat certain types of food. So maybe it's just referring to that here um, during the 1830s, yeah. people had access. There was like nothing that you could have just because you weren't born to a specific class. So in a way, America is kind of what he's describing because you know, uh, in in a sense, um, like the ability of means. Barack Obama can go and get a cheeseburger, and we can go get a cheeseburger. Like, there's no law saying that only, you know, the president of the United States is allowed to have allowed to have this particular pleasure. So, would that qualify? Well, he can have his own private vessel. Right. Okay. That's, yes. that's, that's yes, but I'm, mm -hmm. well, I was going to say, point out, like she said, during the France when he was writing this, the president. Well, in America, during the time that he was writing this, the the president or whoever was in charge that they basically was on the same list as everyone else. How did the president want the White House? Was it the president? Well, not the White House, I was saying, just like his connection. Well, I'm wondering, it seems to me that what you all are disagreeing about is whether the equality in the political equality. In other words, are you forbidden? Is, are there some plans that are forbidden to do things by the government? Or are you talking about actual equality, everybody having the same thing, same level, being able to do things the same thing? That's, yeah, I think that's where the problem comes in, because we don't really know what equality he's referring to. So are you saying uh, we all have the equal opportunities to become doctors or lawyers? Or are you saying we all get the same amount of income, same health care, we all wear the same outfit? Is this the uh, equality of outcome where we all look the same, do the same things, and then there's an equality where, hey, we're all going to end up being different, but we have the choices to do the same thing, or work just as hard as another person. Um, he actually mentioned something about equality um, later in paragraph four that actually confused me um, a little bit more, and it was, uh, Who's that? it is, it's like in the very middle of the paragraph, I can read it, but I can't, uh, like the very middle, um, it's the equality of conditions is how he labels it, and um, it starts with, freedom uh, cannot therefore form the distinguishing characteristic of democratic ages, um, the peculiar and preponderating fact which marks those ages as its own is the equality of conditions. The ruling passion of men in those periods is the love of equality. And for me, I didn't really, I didn't find that like a sufficient definition. It just kind of seemed like a circular loop to me. But that might have, I might be seeing it just not. Would anybody else In the background chapters, he goes, um, he's kind of, he goes on about talking about how the Puritans, they were all mostly middle class, and yeah. then, yeah. so it's kind of talking about how, I think, sorry. I think it's important when you're looking at that, <coughs> that particular um, passage is, you have to kind of read the sentence before that a little bit, and it says that freedom has appeared in the world at different times and under various forms has not exclusively, been exclusively bound to any social condition that's not confined to democracy. So he's saying that freedom was born before democracy. So democracy doesn't exist because of, and freedom doesn't exist because of democracy. Democracy exists because of freedom and equality, in essence. And then, so then he says, freedom cannot therefore form the distinguishing characteristic of democratic ages. So because freedom existed before democracy, it can't be the defining characteristic of democracy. So then we have to look at what that defining characteristic is, and he's going to argue that it's equality. You know, it's the ruling passion of men in those periods of life. That's how I understood it. Okay. Okay. Do you have something you want to say? Yeah, I'm just going on on page six and seven, or on seven here. 
as a prerequisite to the equality that everyone is born to have is because they have had similar conditions and that when, when the Puritans came to America, they all had a similar mindset and they came from a similar condition. They didn't have them that many material position, possessions, so they were united on the front that they would value equality above everything else and that they shared everything that they knew. And I wonder if that's related to what you're saying, Luke, like, because were they a democratic society? They were. In New Jersey? In Jersey? Um, from what we know, we From what we know, we know that they, they were. Which the one? Greens. No, I don't know. Um, specifically, when he was talking about like the laws that they passed, uh, based on like, their moral code, they were, they were Republican, they had a Republican form. Uh, he specifically mentions that the townships were, were Republican. Uh, but that it was a it was a strange phenomenon because in Europe it was the development from the from like the top down of the monarchy and then the towns. Uh, but in America the towns formed and then uh, then from the bottom from the top. So I think like they had like this like, kind of like quasi republican like, in their towns they had uh, this sense of like republicanism, but they still like had, they didn't question the, the monarchy or the king or they were serving some English throne. But they understood republicanism in a way because they had they had a direct access to it in the townships and with this town hall style of, of uh, governance that kind of developed out of uh, this period. So I think the question was really from the democratic. I think like it's the little the little bit of yes and no. They're democratic in our local life, but globally. Some people think uh, healthcare is a right, and some people think it's not a direct right where someone has to give it to you. They say a right is something. Uh, uh, they, they would debate, you know, people would debate whether healthcare is a right that you have to have, or it's a right that you can go get it if you want. So we think we have another problem of defining what a right is, uh, which is a problem today. Would it matter if everyone has the same right? Because in that sense, even if they have limited rights, but everyone has. Oh, okay, so I got, I got what you're saying. Like, in, so, in terms of defining the problem. Okay, I understand what you're saying. Uh, so, it doesn't matter how you define rights in this situation, just so long as everyone has the same ones. Okay. Just, I mean, later on, he talks about being equal in slavery. So, that's something that's important. Okay. So, 
in, it sounds like these contain like the best, most ideal equality that has existed has been under altruism. Uh, so it sounds like whatever those rights are, even if you don't have a lot of them, as long as they are the same, if nobody has no rights, or everybody has no rights, then you're equal. This is related to that. It seems like if he's uh, talking about it in terms of absolute kings and those conditions, Butler's ranks and their subjects. It seems like that if that's what he's talking about, then possibly the equality is about like social position or something like that. Because if you're talking about levelers of ranks, and if that's relevant to talking about equality, then it seems like what we're talking about is equality of social position. Um, I know that this was supposed to be also information um, kind of general, but um, I'm curious about your information, um, kind of general. But um, I, I did actually want to ask if we're sure about what he means by levelers because. Um, there was a political group in the 17th, 18th century um, England that was actually, um, they were like fighting for equal rights. So it's using like the they term. They were called the levelers. Yeah, they were, they were called the levelers, excuse me. They were pretty much communists. Right, and um, so are the, is he referring to that actual political group at this point? Or is, like, is this just like a, a term that he's using? I don't know if he's referring to those levelers that absolutely he probably is because they were at the time of the English Civil War, they were very, very also anti monarch. But I'm saying that the reason why is because when he says absolute kings and levelers, I think if he's more or less referring to the levelers of ranks amongst their subjects, he's not talking about equality with the ruler amongst his subjects. He's talking kind of probably talking about absolute slavery. And not in that term, but he's just saying that or or a sort of tyranny. That's why I think from it. Yeah, I was just going to say that I think that in this context, when he's saying leveler, he just means someone who is doing leveling. He's not talking about the uh, is, royal appearance. Is there something about the sentence? Yes. The word is used that puts us in all. Yeah, yeah. Most efficient levelers of ranks. Levelers of ranks means that leveler is, uh, of ranks is qualified as levelers, so it's exactly. or being used more generally rather than. Does he have a different thought about it? Well, to, like, whether or not it was referring to a specific group or not, well, well, basic grammar is not capitalized. If you were going to refer to the group as a, as the level, that's a good point. The, the top of grammar. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I, I, I think like, if we're just discussing like, the level of group that's being discussed, uh, you said that the level of group was like you know social, like a social movement that's almost communistic and sort of like level society. Uh, well, it says absolute kings were the most efficient levelers. So I don't think the kings were necessarily well, right. I, I took it as it, what it could have been, and I might have completely read this wrong, but the way I took it is um, tyrannical absolute kings could have been the most efficient ways of convincing people to kind of do what it was, just because, like, it, when you're opposed way. to something... I took it a different way. Like, no, you're okay. Um, <laughs> you know, when, when there's a tyrannical force, it's easier to be opposed to that and, like, kind of that can actually be the guiding force that steers you in the other direction. Um, and it, I don't know, it just kind of sounded like that to me. So they were the lowest. Yeah, lowest. yeah, they that's lowest. what I think, okay. yes. I think what he means is that the absolute kings have effectively leveled everybody at the same playing field since they have no way to gain power through through their birthright. They are all equal in their, in their impoverishment. In their, there's some lords and stuff, but basically, in the essence of they can never attain wealth and power. They can never uh, they can never become the absolute king because of their birth. So they've been efficiently leveled at their certain rate. Um, I'm kind of getting along to that, but I, what I took away from the absolute kings was essentially like the literalism of the text is that the fact that they were the most efficient levelers and leveling everyone but themselves as, you know, equal but it's still under tyranny because, um, like, um, two two kings come to my my mind are the son King Louis the Fourteenth and Ivan the Ivan the Terrible, who 
does exactly that, who turns the people against the nobility to level them all. You know, that's where he is supreme. So that's kind of what I think about that. But it's still all, it, but it's still what he's referring to as a sort of despotism. Um, yeah, I just want to point out, um, if we're talking about like sort of the purest form of equality here, he does, like Hippo does discuss this in paragraph two. He says, um, such a thing, let me start with the word. Sorry, it's about in the middle, or actually second sentence. It says, let us suppose that all the members of the community take part in the government and that each of them has an equal right to take part in it. As none is different from his fellows, none can exercise a tyrannical power. And then at the bottom he says, such is the completest form of that equality can still upon him. So in this case, he's saying that like no person is different from one another, and whether this is like, um, whether the kings are enforcing this or just because everyone's like working together and everyone's taking part in the government, that means that all of them have like the same equal opportunity, so they're all the same. And I think that kind of goes back to like the whole socialist idea of how like every if everyone is the same, then that is the purest form of equality. You said equal right to take part in it. So the whole by being able to have one vote, you have an equal right to have a vote. So I'm saying your vote is equal to everyone else. I mean, if you have the right to take part in it, and so does everyone else, but your vote doesn't mean that it has nothing in you, you're still technically given the right and equal opportunity to make a vote. Yeah, exactly. Because no one's different from another, so your vote is not different from mine, and it's all the same. If you have the opportunity, then your vote is the same. It counts as one. Right. That's just not how I'm taking it, I guess, because equal right to take part in it does not relate to equal vote, like equal amount of vote. He also says in like the closet right before that, he says, all the members of the community take a part in the government. So I think he's saying like, if everyone took a part because they all had the equal opportunity to take a part, then they would all be the same. So I think he's saying like, if in perfect society, every single person was was like had a had a role in the government, then they would all be equal. Isn't that the definition of like a pure democracy though? Yeah, I think that's what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. He says to this ideal state the members the democratic nations came. So this is like like the
not to themselves, this is the beginning of caring, not to themselves they will seek it, cherish it, we're talking about uh, freedom, uh, and view any privation of it with regret, but for equality, their passion is ardent, insatiable, incessant, invincible. They call for equality and freedom, and if they cannot obtain that, they still call for equality and slavery. They will endure poverty, servitude, barbarism, but they will not endure aristocracy. This is true at all times, especially true in our own. So, I, I also want to take it back to okay. the different things that people have said about equality. Do you mean that people are actually equal in everything they have and everything they no. do? Or do we mean that they have equal rights under the government? Or do we, do we mean that they're of equal social rights? I think he's arguing for equal rights under the government based on what he's looked at. I think that, I think that, but my point was that he kind of overlooked other aspects of the society that were equal. Uh, on uh, page 9 of the background text, in the second paragraph in the bottom, the short one back, the uh, Bill talks about Connecticut and he says, In Connecticut, the electoral body consisted from its origin of the whole number of citizens. And this is readily to be understood when we recollect that the people enjoy the most perfect equality of fortune and uh, still great uniform means for them. And he talks about how everybody coming in is basically middle class and basically have the same troubles together. So, I think one example he has seen was Connecticut, where everybody participated and everybody was essentially nearly equal in the, their opportunities and the, the cultural things to participate in. So, it was a little bit of a necessary thing. It seems to me to be related to this description in the, what was the paragraph two? Um, to this ideal state democratic nation center, that one where he's saying everybody's participating. Mm -hmm. And he does have tension. Mm -hmm. So it seems like if we go back to the chapter that Lucas was, uh, the, not chapter, the uh, paragraph that Lucas was talking about, I think it's a paragraph, uh, let's see again, paragraph 8. Um, the fact that, oh, sorry, not paragraph 8. Nine. Nine, that's correct. Right. Okay, so it says, um, but for equality, the passion are in social incessant, they call for the equality of freedom, they cannot obtain it, they still call it get into slavery, uh, they only endure poverty, poverty serve few barbers, and they will not endure aristocracy. And so it seems to me that if the large, the sharp contrast here is between the equality in slavery versus uh, not equality. The, the, the perfect example of not equality here is, is aristocracy, and that seems to be implying that we're talking about a social rank. And then earlier we said the king and mother of rank, and the relevance there seems to be that that we're talking about equality of social position. So, basically, was that basically what I was trying to say? Oh, okay. right. well, but it seemed like you were saying equal rights, and that's not the same thing yeah. as social position. Oh, okay. Um, well, I think I think he's touching on both because he does touch on right. both. Yeah, he's, he's talking about the inequality of freedom and equality. Yeah, so I think I think there's a basically both. Right. But I agree with what you said. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah.
So people are still, you know, you, people realize that capitalism isn't about uh, equality of rank. It's about you, know, you are what you, uh, what you, what you, your amount of effort determines you know who you become and all that. Uh, so they realize that you can't have equality of rank in capitalism. So they say if we can't all be rich in equality, why don't we all just be poor in equality? In socialism. Uh, so yeah, that thing would have to do with rank. At least in that part, but if, if you guys are saying he has two definitions, then that's a problem because I just I don't, I don't think that this thing necessarily has two definitions, but I think he just thinks that the social position of quality is associated with the political social mm -hmm. equality. So he's like saying that people who are socially equal will want political equality, and the people who are politically equal will want to make government make them socially equal. Mm -hmm. And I think he's kind of critical of that because. Uses aristocracy, which he's probably using Aristotle's definition, which is the rule of the by the few for the good of the many. So even if you have a few good men going for the good of the many, people in socially equal democratic societies only value equality and they don't value actual wealth or anything else. So they're just focused on the single principle of the home, the welfare, the freedom, or something like that. So he would be saying that's sort of a problem. And I mean, that makes sense because uh, he's from France, which was trying to imitate the American. Yeah, I, I like what you talked about, just the fact that he's from France at this time because, like, what year does he actually come? I believe it is 1829. You know, for a fact. I think it is 1829. Well, I, mean, I don't. Oh, yeah, but yeah, but I mean, that would be. Because if he's coming after 1824, you know, that's actually when you, know, you get the more socialist developments in the French Revolution that are coming up. Because, like, most of the time, the 1789 one is more uh, bourgeoisie type oriented. But I think that if he's talking about that, then I think that his last sentence, or the last part of it, where he talks about um, they cannot call for it, um, they cannot obtain it, they'll be wanting to be equal in slavery. And that's pretty much what they. That I guess what they would call it for. So would he be critical of the French Revolution's uh, passion for I don't think he's more passion for equality than he's more passion for equality than he's being, yeah. they being um, more, uh, more critical of. I, I was just at that point. I don't think he's being critical of the quality of what he's given here. You know, in the whole piece. He, he's actually saying, like, if you read the last sentence, in my opinion, in our age, freedom cannot be established without it. And this is about, he's talking about equality. In our age, freedom cannot be established without it, and despotism itself cannot reign without its support. So he's saying, it's like a nuanced argument, I think. He's saying that equality can, uh, can, only, can bring about freedom, but also it can bring about despotism. So people, and people in his argument, the forms of the masses, are so in support of equality that they would support equality that meant they could be free, but they would also support equality that meant they were in shame. So I think that to that point, he's saying that equality shouldn't be held up as this lofty idea that it's the only thing you have to attain, but that it has to be mixed with freedom in some sort of some person. I think that's important to bring about because he's, I think with that he said equality can bring up uh, freedom or uh, despotism. And I mean, I would argue uh, equality of opportunity would be freedom, equality of rank would be despotism. So I think he's, what he's saying then is that, that since people are calling for equality in slavery, then they're obviously not concerned about opportunity, they're concerned about rank, and that's the problem, uh, would be uh, focusing on quality of rank instead of opportunity. Yeah, I was actually going to say with the he's talking about, um, you know, if we're talking about equality in respect to like, the slavery ideal, and I feel like that's less about political equality because if people are still calling for like, um, equality, whether they are free or whether they are slaves, then that's more about like, social equality and how they are in comparison to other people versus like their political equality and like their right to vote and their right to, to the part in the government. So if that's the kind of equality, I feel like that's the discussion we need to the what is talking about before social equality. So perhaps it's more social equality that he's discussing. Um, I don't know what you what do you guys think. I mean I think uh, it would be the again he's like he's showing that he doesn't do a good job defining obviously that's why we're spending like an hour yeah. three hour yeah. <laughs> but like, like, I mean, like Luke just pointed out, uh, he does say, what, do you remember what paragraph exactly? Maybe not. Yes. Where, where he uh, said equality can lead to uh, despotism or freedom. That's the last sentence of the last sentence. Oh, the last sentence. 
Yeah, okay. So that shows that uh, there's obviously, there are obviously two different things, and uh, one's problematic, one one can be good. He just did a really poor job of explaining, explaining both of them. Uh, but I mean, I mean, we could, I mean, uh, maybe I just want to change the subject here, which is uh, okay. maybe, maybe not yet. I did, but then I tried to disperse it. Um, on page five, I mean, this whole thing is separate from democracy in America, and it goes on the, on the last sentence, on the third paragraph of uh, page five, he goes, talking about the Puritans, nor did they cross the Atlantic to improve their situation, but to increase their wealth. The call with some of them from the comforts of their homes was purely a thought tool. And facing the inevitable sufferings of exile, their object was the triumph of an idea. And the idea, and in the sentence before it, um, they had not been obliged by necessity to leave their country. The social position they abandoned was one to be regretted, and the means of subsistence were certain. So the very essence of democracy in America, or by the Puritan scheme, was what? The triumph of equality and social position. I think that's what he's saying. Mm -hmm. You're the last. Yeah, last two sentences in the third paragraph. Uh, in my notes, I wrote um, that these ideas brought um, ideas brought the settlers uh, to North America. Like the ideas of religious freedom and also ideas of like, society. Uh, was that the same? The same. What page? Page five. Page five. Page five. Is that there? Yeah. Okay. So now I'm saying uh, they're kind of spurred almost by a sense of social justice, and uh, they just they kind of despise the society uh, that they were. Because it was not not just because they weren't allowed to practice their religion, but because uh, the tenets of their faith were democratic, and the tenets of the, of monarchy are anti-democratic. So basically, they uh, established a new colony in America that is based on these principles, and that's why out of this out of these like origins, which is he's really like intent on like studying the origins of everything. So through these origins, we can understand why democracy developed. In and then that equality of position proceeded. Yes. I was just saying another thing here is that is that on the first page on chapter I keep saying that I don't know why. Uh, paragraph three uh, that says although a man cannot become an absolute equal unless they're entirely free and consequently equality when pushed to its further it's furthest extent it may be confounded with freedom. Yet there's a good reason for distinguishing one from the other. So whatever he does think that equality is, whatever he does think that freedom is, they have to be something that if you push them to the fullest extent, they would be one hundred percent identical. But if you don't push them to the fullest extent, they're not identical. It seems like social rank is going to be something like that. And if you push the quality of social rank one hundred percent on the way, then clearly no one's going to be subjugated by another person. And so uh, but if you don't push all the way, then Clearly, can be distinct from freedom. It seems like that's a pretty simple look at it that way. I mean, I go back to the point of like religious freedom in that part. And um, he, he's been talking about the Puritans, and the Puritans, so I think what I really came over here, they ostracized them their religions. And so it wouldn't be religious freedom for the Puritans if they were the only religion that you could actually practice. When the Puritans came over here, um, one of the interesting parts of the city on the hill that was um, basically said that to me is where he says that we will show the one true way to God. That's why they were coming over. We should to create their ideal society, whatever that may be, create the one true way to God, whatever that may be. I don't think they came over here for true reasons, for Messiah's reasons. I was going to make a point uh, to escape the point about something um, about aristocracy and how. Uh, so in, in the, on page four, it's like the uh, one, two, three, third paragraph, last sentence, uh, last couple of sentences, says, land is the basis of an aristocracy which claims to the soil and supports it. For it is not by privileges alone or by birth, but by landed property, handed down from generation to generation that an aristocracy is constituted. A nation may present immense fortunes and extreme wretchedness, but unless those fortunes are territorial, there is no aristocracy. It's simply the class of the rich and that of the poor. So I, I took that to mean that since like, we're talking about aristocracy, like it emerges through like land disputes, basically. So since there was immense resources of land in America that were 
talking about. Um, uh, there wasn't like this view for aristocracy to develop, except in the South, where uh, aristocracy did develop, and it was because their economy was based on land. So I think that that's why the New England, he looks at New England so often, because it's one society where it's truly almost classless, like it's pretty much a middle class. And he's able to look at like the equality of, of the people in that society, and also the fact that they don't have an aristocracy. You were about that, um, that is, I would refer to the Cape Cod and um, the like the English government, and the fourth paragraph now. The English government will not be satisfied with an immigration which removes the elements of fresh discord and of further revolutions. You, uh, the English, I think what you're trying to say is that the English government didn't want a revolution inside their own country, so they uh, encouraged the immigration of those people to the new world. Yeah. Actually, the next sentence actually just says basically that it's the one country, everything was done to encourage, and great ex exertions were made to mitigate the hardships of those who sought a shelter from the rigor of their country's laws and the soil of the Did you have to deal with the hardships of? Class, mm -hmm. which those who did come to the United States were of one class or lower sort. You know what I thought was funny and almost predictive? You know, that very last sentence of that paragraph it says, The Queen of this New England was a region given up, to dream, given up to the dreams of fancy and the unrestrained experiments of innovators. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's so predictive of what's happened. They were strict, and that was actually probably uh, advantageous because uh, for the Europeans, um, it, there was just enough room for it to be different degree. There was room to be start a settlement. Also, I think Maine's like a perfect example. It was probably the most liberal. Um, no, this the Rhode Island. Rhode Island was probably the most liberal settlement. So the fact that even though they didn't agree with the Puritans, um, the very geography of the new land enabled uh, a perfect incubation ground for innovation and more freedom than that was afforded to them. In, in. Yeah, you know, another thing too is, um, despite because I mean, like every co colony in the Northeast, even down to Virginia and the East Coast at the time, was uh, centered around a certain idea of what God would uh, how to uh, worship and everything like that, how to form that perfect. Society, so whenever there's a disagreement, you know, you can leave or you know, get your tongue burned <laughs> that way. But uh, I think what this, I think what that allowed to do is, I don't think that was necessarily for class for, that was not for classes, but I think we use class as far as everybody mostly agreeing on everything. That's what that was. It wasn't more of a class on wealth. So I think going back to the point about uh, about how he was being predicted. In that last sentence, it seemed as if the moment was being given back to the dreams of fancy and the unrestrained experiment of innovators. So, by basically, uh, I think it's predictive of a lot of things, but I think it's predictive of the American Revolution because it sent all these people with revolutionary ideas uh, off to their own spot. Eventually, they're, they're going to think of it as, as theirs, and not, they're not going to want to be ruled by a far off community. But it's also predictive of like, the America that emerged, like, that the book was, was looking at. Of, uh, of like this widespread democratic equality uh, that sort of existed. Uh, because since there was like all these these innovators and these uh, and uh, these people who dreamed of like had these fancy dreams of like uh, religious and so and like religious equality and like a, a classless society almost, uh, it kind of made way for that to, to occur. Um, going off that I think you know same page, same paragraph uh, page seven. The unrestrained experiment of, experiments of uh, innovators just uh, kind of predicted the uh, industrial revolution because it hinges on capitalism itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, highest standards of living ever, America, you know. Uh, but at the time, England was the, already had its industrial revolution too. So, I mean, he's almost, he's not really talking in the future, he's talking about the present. Oh, you mean? No, you know. Oh, England. 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 So he's talking about the, the present, right. but then it's also interesting how he predicts the future. I mean, even if you consider New England, Boston is, is to this day one of the centers of the most innovation in the country. So it's kind of interesting that that, that 
with those people that came here with these ideas and established them. And of course, we have probably the highest concentration of universities in the country in, in the Boston area. So it's still to this day. I think that goes to show you, you uh, I mean, people leave, whatever, whatever uh, reason why they left the uh, oppressive <coughs> England homeland, they come here to innovate, and I mean, that's when you start seeing all sorts of awesome creations and all sorts of uh, beautiful things emerge from the market. Um, uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, on that same page, page 7, the first paragraph is almost like saying about the industry that the English colonies, and this is one of the main causes of their prosperity, is that they have always enjoyed more internal freedom and more political independence than the colonies of other nations. But this principle of liberty was nowhere more extensively applied than in the states of New England. So the fact that they didn't have um, as many limits to, to their potential, they weren't, it was more like how much more can you produce rather than there are like caps put on them and quotas. So I think like markets, who markets play a huge role in being able to exercise and enjoy their quality. And I think that a lot of that emerges because of like, what he's talking about in, in page eight, in the second paragraph. Uh, he's talking about uh, Plymouth Province, New Haven, the state of Connecticut, and that Rhode Island were founded without the cooperation and almost without the knowledge of the other country. The new settlers did not derive their incorporation from the seat of the empire, although they did not deny its supremacy. They constituted a society of their own accord, and it was not until 30 or 40 years afterwards until under Charles II that their existence was legally recognized by the royal charge. So these were people that just went out and that could kind of set up their own colonies. Like even the, the original pilgrims were supposed to start their, their colony in northern Virginia, and they ended up some would say purposely going to Plymouth Rock where they wouldn't have uh, like they would have their own they could set up their own place without the control of the, the English crown. So that this is already setting up like the, this like this feelings of revolution that you know like we don't have to be incorporated by the crown. Even though they don't deny the supremacy, they're already kind of saying that we're separated from that. So they can create their own destiny. Yeah. I think that's also part of like manifest destiny and control of I was not that um, I was going to say, uh, you, you were going off um, like without like, this breaking away from England's control kind of thing, um, and that leading on to innovation. Uh, one of the things that I noticed, uh, the very last last paragraph, of, uh, page 10, religion is no less the companion of liberty in all its battles and its triumphs. The cradle of its infancy and the and the divine source of its claims. Um, later on, a lot of the colleges that were founded during that time, such as Harvard, um, they were they started off primarily for ministers, big ministers, and it changed uh, to other jobs. So it was like it was changing the innovation and creating a more innovative society because now it was going not just for religious reasons. Now it was going for actual. Philosophy was big and psychology was growing at that time. So now we're going to do our free brief. Would anybody like to start saying one thing they thought went well about the discussion and one thing they could improve? One thing I like a lot of was just something just referring to the paragraphs, like page numbers, don't associate to refer to what paragraphs I was talking about. Uh, I guess the one thing I would uh, dislike maybe would be. Again, this would kind of be a problem with the author, but choosing a, a a paper that has such a debate, like this has to do with equality and freedom, yet it's you know, two pages about equality and freedom. If we can't get a, a real good uh, definition of what he means, or understanding of what he means, then it's going to be hard to discuss uh, anything really with the paper. But I mean, that, that, I mean, that could be just a good example of why it's important to define words, so it's, it's still certainly valuable lessons. Um, 
I would prefer probably more background historical information because you know what he's talking to is time and you know age of inequality, which means something quite very obvious to the readers of this time. So like maybe a background, historical background plus the text. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, um, I thought that um, it was good that we referred to specific places in the text. I thought it was good um, that we kind of focused on particular uh, aspects for like a while. I think um, everything that would be that would, I think could be improved would be improved mostly by having more longer session. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know if I have anything that's not answerable by just kind of extending the session. Uh, I thought it was, uh, this is not the first time I've read something like this, uh, I thought it was interesting. The only thing I would have to improve that I guess would have been like if we had more experience and then maybe we can, in a time consuming at the beginning, like figuring out where our thoughts were, I guess. And then what I liked about it, I really just liked the discussion and everybody's ideas about the very varied. And I thought it was good to have a text where we didn't necessarily have like a definitive answer because that like prompts debate and uh, discussion. So I think that's kind of what we're doing. So I think that was a good, good piece to talk on. And uh, I think uh, that was numbered with a good idea. I like that uh, we all try to keep the same foundation of what words mean and as well as saying what we're saying. Because um, a lot of the debate obviously was about what is equality. And I think. There's still a lot more in the text, I think, outside of what we went into that could help us get to the picture of these views that would be answered during a longer session. But to me, I think that's part of my personal interest on that. One of my personal that, 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 that points of interest that I wrote down. The very last sentence, I think, some of us, um, which was like my dream, how these factors are about equality and justice, which I can't think about this term, which I think is like, no matter what your view is of equality, you perhaps why you think find it explicitly is that there are different types of freedoms and there are different ways to achieve it, which is the right way to achieve equality is it through democratic opportunity or is it through top down you know like we were like right. Well um to start off the conversation went really well like no one stepped on anyone else's toes and we all used the evidence like particularly well like we didn't have any arguments that were unfounded. Um, to improve it, it would probably be just going back on some other points. Um, maybe we could have had more of a like set schedule. Like there were a lot of topics that we didn't get to because we were going to go in 
this one specific topic for the bulk of the session. Also, I guess historical context could be good because words change based on time and geographic information. Um, I thought that we all really, <clears throat> I'm sorry, we all discussed really well together. Um, you said that no one really argued with each other. There was back and forth, but everyone still got a chance to speak, and I think that's really important, especially when everyone has different opinions. Um, yeah, I mean, and the session was a little bit longer because we got into uh, the, the bulk of the text really rather than just spending time on the definitions. Like, you know, if we can talk more about freedom versus equality, I think that would make for um, a more interesting discussion just kind of the bare bones. Um, yeah, I, I'd say that I, I like that we were able to continue for such a long time debating. I, I mean, what I thought was uh, with, with unique ideas the whole way to debate what the terms were, but then we also only debated what the terms were. So it kind of, kind of both sides of the fence. There were, there were some other issues I would like to get to, but it was also important to define that. So uh, I, I also like how we. I did a good job of referring to the uh, background text as well. Uh, and then I'm entering to it, I've got to cut it somewhere, so I think that's going to be an inherent problem. I didn't participate very much because I had a hard time really following sort of the system of the conversation. It was not the format, but it felt like people were making comments and sort of um, not so much arguments as just sort of statements that weren't as directed immediately to the issue at hand. And so at times it felt difficult for me to see the layout of like the ideas that were being presented. Um, but overall I thought that mostly that would be just an issue of people having more experience with this kind of conversation and really maybe having more time to sort of flesh out the ideas being presented. So what was good? Um, that everyone made like an effort, even with the time and sort of past experience. I thought that the working within the text was very helpful. I also felt actually kind of to the opposite of what some people have said that limiting it to this selection of text was actually very useful in that it allowed us to um, both dig into the text very specifically and um, didn't require a sort of increasingly unwieldy, expansive um, amount of. This was my first uh, seminar where pretty much everybody used the text and made like cogent efforts to um, connect ideas that were used in the text. But there were lots of points, um, mostly those in the background maybe that couldn't get addressed. And that's you know, as everyone has already mentioned, that was you know constrained with time, spending a lot of it in an effort to understand what um, Plato's concept. I liked the text and I liked the author. Um, I was kind of upset that we kind of just debated what he was saying, the right definitions, what I thought was going to the discussion of the he was saying, or at least my understanding. And I would have probably debated like the merits of those ideas, but it was a big one. So, like, freedom versus equality, like, which one is better, like, religion in this world, freedom, or like, respecting the world versus Islam. I generally like how um, we all, we as people all generally every day have the same like, political ideas and, and stuff, but whenever it came to just straight like, definitions of what is equality, we all have different ideas of what it could be. And so it kind of like brought us apart for that reason, uh, but in a sense it also brought us together because it's the same thing um, for that. Um, but overall, I, I like how it it generally like our debates um, weren't really kind of heated and it was just a calm discussion and there was really no kind of question as to why why we were so much for this thing.
um, I'm glad that it wasn't something that just kind of sat around and like, yeah, uh, so that was enjoyable. And I just have to say that that paired with uh, the time constraint was probably the biggest frustrating part. It was just that we, we couldn't really delve into um, the majority of the text because there was not a time. But I'm glad that we didn't have any free text. And, yeah, so. I would say, given the time restraint, I mean, that's always going to be a, a matter. Um, you know, you start off asking about what kind of questions we had, and I think, like, okay, so if we have an hour, uh, maybe someone says, okay, I had this question, and then we all say, yeah, I have similar, similar ideas, I have those questions too, so we write on the board at one point what we want to discuss, and then we have a, you know, next person goes, and we all like, kind of see if uh, we share that interest in that topic, so we're at two points, like, whether we have two points, uh, and an hour of discussion, maybe we do 30 minutes, 30 minutes, three points, you know, separate it based off time. I mean, that would just be maybe my idea of it. Because then we can come up with a conclusion, like, hey, we're not going to get to this point, we're not going to understand, uh, if it's not uh, necessary to get done with this point, to continue the conversation, let's just leave it and move on and maybe get something else from it. There's one I think uh, uh, a lot of, I know I did, but I'm not going to speak about it, but brought in a lot of outside information and it had a benefit to what, limiting the text, like some of those texts that let the interpreter just get lost in the idea of that. And I think if we uh, could like, limit a lot of outside information and just use the where, where in the text does it say that more often. Mm -hmm. Everybody was just so eager and so into it. So I love that there's like everybody's energy. That was really great. And I think the last thing you said also, I think to improve upon it, I think sticking a little bit more closely to the text. And um, also, I think Jason, he's not here anymore, but he had mentioned um, that maybe we listen better to each other and respond. Because otherwise, oh, actually, it was really nothing. But the conversation just kind of moving around and we didn't really follow through with an idea, which I think is what kind of took up all that time. So maybe really listening better, responding through. Um, but other than that, I think everybody's energy is so great. So thank you. And uh, can I just think about for people who have not been involved in the conversation like this, that you all jumped in and you uh, worked really hard and you obviously had read it before and you tried to analyze it, so that's great. Um, I wish that, uh, like Liz said, we, we have been paying attention more to each other and trying to respond directly to each other. And also, that would draw in people who weren't talking as much. But I would like to hear it. Uh, since I always learn a lot by hearing everybody's different interpretations of the text, I'd like to hear from everybody. And sometimes a really quiet person has uh, something really great to say, too. And as far as um, not getting to what, we, what some people wanted to get to, I just want to point to um, one of the discussion rules, which is that you're responsible, each person takes responsibility for his own own learning. So if you'd like to change the direction of the discussion, you can bring it up. And you can, you can check with your other participants and say, well, no, I'd really like to get to this other point in the text. Uh, would it be okay if we switch what we were talking about right now? Even though we haven't quite come to a conclusion about something. So that's something you can do too. Um, I had one more thing to say about you because I thought you'd find it interesting. And that's a, a paper that compares this kind of dialogue to what you should consider the debate. And kind of points out the different the distinctions between the two. So I thank you very much for coming. Thank you. 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 Uh, for the whole week, and on all kinds of stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Science, philosophy, poetry, art, and history, economics, and, and uh, what students with those programs end up feeling is that they have really shored up their sense of independence, their confidence in themselves, and their ability to understand anything without an expert telling them. Fill out your evaluation forms. Yeah, fill them all out. Everybody, don't leave until you fill it out. Fill it out, fill it out, fill it out, fill it out, fill it out.